Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Brian Sturm and I work at the School of Information and Library Science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. My area of interest is uh, children's work in public libraries and I'm also a storyteller and so what I thought I would do for you today is to give you an idea of not so much storytelling but story reading. Now I've looked through a lot of the information on the internet and I found that there are people out there who have done some very good read-alouds. So if you need examples of those kinds of things, then you can certainly track them on the internet. But what I haven't found, and what I thought I would offer, is a sense of the mechanics of reading aloud. How do you actually hold a book when you want to read it? How do you face or not face the audience? Those kinds of things. So. Without further ado, I'll launch into that and see if I can offer you some pointers on how to read aloud, or how not to read aloud, as the case may be. The first thing you need to consider is that your audience is going to be sitting in front of you. Now, if you let the audience get too wide, too far on either side of you, it's going to be very hard, first of all, for them to see the book, and secondly, for you to show them all of the pictures. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to spend time having to hold the book and show it back and forth like a fan to all of the children so that they can see. Instead what you want to do is move your audience. You want to move your audience so that they are in about a 90 degree angle. Because in 90 degrees in front of you, you can easily make eye contact with all of the children and they can easily see the book. So remember that about 90 degrees, that's a good distance. Now the other problem with beginning uh, read-alouders is that they have a tendency to want to face the audience. That's a good tendency to have. The problem is that when you hold a book and face your audience, no matter where you hold the book, you can't read it. So what you have to do is you have to turn yourself slightly to one side depending on which hand you're holding the book in. So, I like to read aloud with my right hand holding the book, and so I would turn just a little bit to the right, so that the book is within my view. If you're holding it with your left hand, of course, you would turn slightly to the left. You can still look back and forth to make eye contact, but you'll be able to look and read. Now, how do you hold a book? Well, I've seen some people hold a book this way and read aloud from here. The problem with that, of course, is that you have to learn to read upside down, which is very, very difficult. So in general, holding the book in your lap is not a great way to read aloud. Now, if you've memorized the story, then of course you can do that because you don't have to see the words. But for most librarians, we don't have time to, read, to uh, memorize, and so we're going to need to be able to see the words. Again, if you turn slightly to one side and hold the book, you'll be able to read aloud. Now, I have seen some people hold the book this way, because they can bring it in a little closer. But it is immensely uncomfortable to try and read a book from here and um, not hurt your shoulder. The other problem is that as you turn pages from here, there's a high likelihood that you may drop the book. So instead of holding it on top, hold it underneath, right there in the crease. And that will support it, and it will allow you to see it and read it and turn the pages. Now again, if I hold the book here, I can't read it. So what I need to do is I need to move it a little bit farther away from my body. As I turn my body a little bit to the side, and I hold the book out a little bit farther, I can still read the book if I take this corner of the book and ease it back slowly, rotating my wrist until it rests right against my arm, against my forearm there. The beauty of that is that if you're new to reading aloud, the book has a tendency to do this, 
because you're nervous. And easing that wrist around until this part rests against your forearm will help solidify the book and hold it still as you're reading. Now, once you've got it there and you see that I'm turned slightly sideways so that I can read the book, but the book is still facing forward so that all of my children can read it, then I'm ready to go. The next problem, though, is how do I turn the pages? Because I've got to do that at some point. The easiest way to turn the pages, if you're holding it in your right hand, and if the book is a typical European or English language book that reads from the top left to the bottom right, then hold the book in your right hand, turn the page from the bottom, and it's very easy to do so without getting in the way. The problem with holding the book in your left hand is that in order to turn a page, you have to reach all the way across the front of it, and it blocks what the children can see. And believe me, they will let you know if you block the picture. So for a traditional English language book, holding it in your right hand makes the most sense. Easing it around so that it touches and rests on your forearm, and then reading and turning the pages from the bottom is very, very easy. Now, those are the basics of the mechanics of holding a book and reading it out loud. But what about a book makes it a good read aloud? Because you can have all the mechanics in the world, and if you choose the wrong book, it's still not going to work. Let me show you a couple of examples of what I consider to be good read alouds. The first one is the one that I've been holding here. It's Oink by Margie Palatini. Now, one of the reasons I like this book is that the illustrations are very, very simple. There is a, not a lot going on. The animals are big so that you can see them very easily, even if you were sitting in the back of a classroom. You could see these animals. And the, the simple illustrations are also very highly contrasting. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that if you look at a figure, it is a good contrast color to the background so that it pops, so that it stands out. Oftentimes in these beautiful picture books, the, the pictures will be so intricate that seeing something of importance really requires that you are up close to the book and reading it yourself. That means that it's not so good as a read aloud even if the story is great, because the children won't be able to see in the pictures what they need to see. So keep the illustrations as simple as you can. Now, the sharp contrasting colors help the figure to pop. There's another issue, and that is, look at the edges here, all the way around the animals. The edges are very clearly defined. That, too, helps the image stand out from the background. If the image doesn't have those clear lines, usually fairly heavy black lines to outline the creatures, then again the children won't be able to see or pick out from the picture what's important. Now you can, of course, as you read, you can point to things and show the children what you want them to look at. However, if you get a very complex picture, it's going to be very hard for you to point to exactly what you want them to see while you're reading. Look at this picture book and have a look at the text. There's not a lot of text on each page. That's a good thing because the more text there is, the harder it is for your eye to track across the text lines and keep your place. You also want to have fairly large text, and this is on the small side. It makes it a little harder to read. Big text, you can see from a distance, the children can see from a distance, and it makes for an easier reading experience. But even with the smaller text, this is still a fairly easy story to read aloud. 
let me start here at the beginning. And what often happens with readers is that when they open the book to read aloud, they show the front page, which is good, right, the cover, to show the children what the story is about, and often the title is fairly big on the cover, so it's easy for them to see. Another interesting piece are the end pages, and sometimes the end pages are just color, but sometimes they have illustrations that are important to the story. If that's the case, show the children the end pages and perhaps have a short explanation of what they see. Then comes the title page. The title page is very often, especially in picture books, a repeat of the cover. And so you may not learn a lot from the title page. But if you want to, the title page is a useful piece as well. And then, of course, the story starts. Now, one of the problems with uh, story reading is that depending on your eyesight, you may read normally with glasses, in which case you can use your glasses to read. My trouble is the opposite. I can't see close up with my glasses on, so I would need to take my glasses off in order to read a picture book like this. Thomas and Joseph were pigs. They were sloppy. They were lazy. They were dirty. And they were happy. Oink, said Thomas. Oink, agreed Joseph. And on you go. The story, the kind of story that you're going to want to read aloud, will have a lot of action in it, and this one does, and a lot of emotional expression. This one also has that. Because if it's just plot, it won't be engaging to the children as much. If it's emotionally engaging, that's when children really get immersed and begin to watch and listen very, very carefully. And of course, you'll want to use all of the techniques of good reading aloud, which you can find on the internet, with your voice, changing your voice, perhaps adding character voices. In this particular story, you have two hens, a rabbit, and a duck. You could add a character voice for the hens, sounding a little hen-like, perhaps. Maybe putting in a ah, now and then, or saying, I don't know what you're doing, as to try and keep that voice going. The rabbit, when you think of rabbit, what do you think of? Most people think of that big nose, that little titchy nose, and the long ears. It's awfully hard to do long ears, but that little nose is very easy to do. And duck, quack. Maybe a low voice like this. The problem with character voices is that if you get a lot of characters, as there are in this book, you may forget what your voice was for each character. So what I suggest is to perhaps choose one or two characters, at most, to give a character voice. Let me show you a different book. This one is called Llama Llama Red Pajama by Anne Dudney. This is a wonderful read aloud. It's full of emotion. It's uh, about a young llama who's a little afraid to go to sleep by himself. Now you'll notice here that I've put a small paper clip in the upper corner. The reason for that is that the end pages here are not all that interesting. And the title page doesn't add much to the story. And so if I put that paper clip there, I can open directly to the first page that I want to read. In this case, Llama Llama Red Pajama reads a story with his mama. Now, in this text, you'll see something else that's very important, rhythm. Text that is rhythmic and flowing is very easy on the ear. And children love the rhyme as well. So if you can find texts that are poetry, if you can find texts that have a lilting rhythm to them, then their children will be more likely to get immersed in them. Rhythmic flow, rhyming. Onomatopoeia is a possibility as well. Onomatopoeia being words that sound like the, the word that they're representing. So here you've got, again, great contrast between the llama, the, the animals, and the background colors so that, so that the pictures pop. You've got fairly strong lines delineating the outside. 
of the characters, clear edges there, very large text, very little text per page, and the text is in good contrast to the background as well. Because if the text blends in with the background, you're not going to be able to read it. Mama kisses baby's hair. Mama Llama goes downstairs. Llama Llama, red pajama, feels alone without his mama. Baby Llama wants a drink. Mama's at the kitchen sink. Oh, and it gets worse. He gets very, very frightened as time goes by because Mama is not coming. She can't hear it. So Llama Llama Red Pajama is a wonderful, wonderful read aloud. Let me show you one last one here. This is Stella Luna by Janelle Cannon. And it's a beautiful little story of a bat growing up. But growing up without his mother, in this case, or her mother, if you prefer. But again, you've got a, a little bit more text, still large enough to read easily. You've got lovely illustrations that uh, show the action, depict the action as it happens. Uh, good contrasting colors, good edges, sharp edges. And the language in this is really lovely. In a warm and sultry forest, far, far away, there once lived a mother fruit bat and her new baby. Oh, how Mother Bat loved her soft, tiny baby. I'll name you Stella Luna, she crooned. Each night, Mother Bat would carry Stella Luna clutched to her breast as she flew out to search for food. And it goes on, they run into an owl, and uh, poor Stella Luna is dropped and ends up in a uh, being raised by Mother Bird trying to figure out who she is. It's a lovely story. Um, fits all of the, the characteristics of a really good read aloud. Now, one of the last things I want to mention is that as you hold these books and as you read aloud, particularly if you're holding it up high so that you can read it easily, your shoulder muscles are really going to start to hurt. And if you hold it there too long, they'll hurt so much that your book will begin to shake. So here's what I suggest. Hold it up there as you read. When you come to turn the page, relax your shoulder so that your elbow comes down and these muscles get a break. You can turn the page and then bring it back up so that you're reading on a level with your eyes again. And when you're finished with that page, remember to try and keep this part close up against your arm to hold it still. When you're ready to turn the page, again, relax your shoulder, turn your page, raise it back up, and continue reading. Well, I hope you found this helpful, uh, and um, I will end there. Thank you very much.